Once again, a trout falls for the trap set for it by an angler. Although it will probably never understand the mysterious force that pulls it so inexorably out of its element, we would like to be able to reassure it that this terrible struggle will end in its being restored to freedom. This group includes many species of nymphs, such as the Heptagenidae and the Ecdionuridus genus, which are shaped to withstand fast-flowing currents while sticking to stones on the floor of rivers. To imitate them, we will use lead foil from the neck of a wine bottle. Cut a thin strip of a width in keeping with the size of the hook. Tie in the tip of the foil at the beginning of the curve, adapting it as well as possible to the hooked surface. Then wind on the tying thread towards the eye. To secure the dressing, cover the hook with fast drying glue. Wind the foil onto the hook fairly loosely, making sure that each spiral partly covers the previous one. Then use the scissors to model the part of the foil to be fixed near the eye. Snip away the excess. And strengthen the foil with a few winds of thread. Now, using a pair of flat-nosed pliers, Flatten the foil as closely as possible onto the shank, from the eye to the curve. If necessary, repeat the operation. The nymph's tail is made with two or three stripped fibers taken from a large goose or turkey feather. Bring the thread back to the curve in wide spirals and tie in the fibers flat side on, slightly splayed and turned downwards. Like this. The making of the abdomen exploits the excellent qualities of liquid lace, which in this case is ochre colored. Tie it in directly in front of the tail. Make the underbody with a lavish dubbing of dirty gold poly. The dubbing will be almost completely covered by the liquid lace, so it must be applied as compressed as possible, first to the thread and then to the hook.
Now complete the dressing of the abdomen by winding on the liquid lace in tight spirals, keeping it well stretched to flatten it and compress the poly. During this operation, some of the material beneath will inevitably poke through. But this is not a bad thing. In fact, to a certain extent, it should actually be encouraged, since it will give the underbody a wavy effect that simulates the nymph's tracheal gills. Use a large domestic hen feather to make the wing case. First, smearing it liberally with glue. Now, shape the feather by running it several times through your fingers from the base to the tip. As the glue dries, the feather will stiffen until it looks like a small peg. Tie in the feather flat side up, keeping in mind that later it will be bent forward towards the eye and tied in quill first. In the meantime, tie it in along the shank with several winds of thread and then cut away the excess material. Make the legs with a hen pheasant wing feather, first cleaning away all the down along the quill, and then shaping it in the same way as the hen feather, but this time against the lie of the fibers. Position the feather at the point where the wing case begins and tie it in securely with several winds of thread. Then snip away the excess. Use a polydubbing again to make the thorax, but in a different color which must contrast with the dirty gold used for the abdomen. In this case too, apply plenty of it and make sure it is well compressed both on the thread and on the hook. If necessary, apply a second amount. Now bend forward the hen pheasant feather and tie in the quill next to the eye of the hook. It must be fixed firmly. Spread the fibers and cut off the excess. In the same fashion, bend forward the hen feather so that it covers the whole dressing as closely as possible and tie it in with several winds. Cut away the excess material and tie off. This type of dressing, in this case applied to a medium-sized hook for display purposes, can be adapted even with different materials to hooks of any size. 
just maintain the same proportions. The end result is always satisfactory, not only from the imitative point of view, but also for fishing. One of the nymphs in question is cast in front of a trout. The effect is immediate, and the angler's choice is proved right at the first attempt. With the right amount of weight, these imitations have the advantage of dropping quickly to the desired depth, and in waters like these, there is no need to cast far upstream of the target. The stonefly owes its name to its habit of going through the final hatch on a stone sticking out of the water. As you can see, it is much bigger than an ephemera. And in the nymph stage, it prefers to live on rock or pebble-strewn riverbeds. The nymphs of some species are vegetarian, but many others are carnivorous, feeding on tiny organisms like the larvae of upwinged flies and annelids. Stoneflies live in the spinner stage from 15 to 30 days. They are not very good at flying, and only the females return to the water to lay their eggs. When conditions are right in an environment like this, it is possible at certain times of the day to see many examples of the same species in flight. After applying a lead spiral to the hook, strengthen the dressing with a few drops of super glue and with wide crisscross spirals of thread. Then, as usual, run the thread back to the beginning of the curve in tighter spirals. Strip clean the quills of goose or turkey feathers to make the nymph's tail. Position them either on each side of the hook or on top, making sure they are well splayed. The stonefly's abdomen consists of a tight series of horny rings, but it is often imitated with more flowing materials, in this case fibers taken from a marabou feather. Tie in a tuft with the tips pointing forwards next to the tail. On several occasions while fishing in central Italy, I have found this particular fly to be almost infallible especially in fast-flowing rivers over a stony bed, where there are large numbers of these kinds of insects. And, of course, this is why I've included it in this collection. After the marabou fibers, tie in a piece of liquid lace, which will serve to simulate the nymph's ribbing. In order to give volume to the abdomen, add some polydubbing to make the underbody. Then twist the marabou fibers together and wind them on in fairly tight spirals. The bulkiness of the fibers makes it almost impossible to use hackle pliers, and the best way is to wind them on by hand, which means that at each wind, the part already applied must be blocked with one hand, while the fibers are twisted and wound on with the other.
After tying in the marabou fibers and snipping away the excess, wind on the liquid lace in wider spirals in the same direction as the main dressing, making sure that a certain amount of material is squeezed out between each spiral. Wind it on tightly, like this. Cut off the excess liquid lace and use your fingers to press back the marabou fibers that are poking out. To make the underside of the thorax, use appropriately colored new dub. Fold it back onto itself in three sections of the same length. Tie them in where the abdomen ends, but on the underside of the imitation. In this case too, it is particularly important to wind on a lot of thread because the new dub, like the rest of the dressing, will be subjected to a lot of tugging before the fly is finally tied off. Now snip off the surplus material. Stoneflies are recognizable by their triple horned wing cases, which are simulated with hen feathers brushed with glue. Position the first feather and tie it in as usual along its entire length. Snip away any excess material and start to build the thorax with a very fluffy dubbing of squirrel fur dyed olive green, which should be applied to the thread without being compressed. Tie it in with a few winds and then bend forward the first feather so that it juts out past the abdomen and tie it in, in the first third of the thorax. Now, cut away the surplus material, then repeat the same procedure with the second feather and another wind of the same dubbing. The feather should be bent forward in such a way that when tied in, it will be slightly smaller than the previous one. While tying in, it's a good idea to squash the feather with your free hand and wind the thread on liberally. Finally, use the third feather, having chosen one that is smaller than the two previous ones, to finish off the nymph's wing cases. Bend the feather forward and tie it in. Snip off all excess material and now bend the new dub forward under the eye of the hook to compress and distribute the material used to build the thorax, in this case squirrel's fur, so that the residue, moving freely on the sides of the imitation, will simulate the frenetic movement of the nymph's legs. Cut away all excess material, 
Tie off with several tight knots and the dressing is complete. The most common material for simulating the nymph's wing cases is a feather section. And in this case, we will use a section taken from a goose wing feather dyed brown. Since we are dealing with stone flies, we will need three sections. The material used for the tail will again be goose quill, while the body will be made with a twisted thread of new dub. The feather section has the advantage of being soft with excellent imitative qualities. But when used in other dressings, for example to simulate sedge fly wings, it tends to fall apart, especially after a few catches. As you can see, the tying procedure is always the same. In this case, however, use residue material to simulate the insect's antennae. To do this, use scissors and a dubbing needle to eliminate the central fibers, leaving only the two on each side. Tie off with a good strong knot and the nymph is ready for use. Our next nymph, the big black swimming stone, is made on a special curved hook designed to imitate the insect's movements. The tails are made with goose quills dyed black. Squirrel fur, also black, is used for the body. And the ribbing is made with medium-sized liquid lace in the same color. Given that stonefly nymphs walk on the bottom as well as swimming with side and vertical movements of the body, it is not unusual for fish to encounter insects in such conditions. After dressing the nymph's body, wind on the liquid lace in tight spirals. Keep it well stretched and leave a little space between one spiral and the next so that the squirrel fur will poke out here and there. As you can see, the dubbing gets very compressed by the liquid lace, so apply lots of it to begin with. Tie in the liquid lace with several winds of thread. Snip off the excess and eliminate all unwanted residue along the abdomen. Make the nymph's legs with single stripped fibers taken from the largest goose or turkey feathers, such as the ones used for the tails. Tie them in to simulate three pairs of legs, flat against each side of the body, starting from the beginning of the thorax, making sure they are angled slightly downwards. Tie in the first quill of the first pair, and then with the same procedure the second one. When they are in place, they should mirror each other. Mm -hmm. 
Make the nymph's wing cases with a section from a turkey feather dyed black and spread with glue. Tie in the section not too close to the base, because at that point the fibers are particularly stiff and might lose cohesion when tied in tightly. After snipping away the excess material, apply a little dubbing wax to the thread and start to make the thorax using the same black squirrel fur as before. In this case, since two of the quills used for the legs are already in place, the dubbing should not be too fluffy, so apply only a small quantity and compress it as much as possible. It goes without saying that animal fur is generally more difficult to work with than poly, and this is why for this dressing it is better to use materials with a lot of underhair. Besides being easier to compress, it has a higher water retention factor, which means that when fishing, your nymph will be more efficient in deep water. At this point, use the dubbing needle to bend forward the feather section, and pinching it into the body, tie it in. and snip off the excess material. Now it is time to add the second pair of legs. As before, tie them in one at a time, starting with the one closest to you. and then the other. It's always advisable when applying materials to the side of the dressing to start on the side facing you, so that length and angle are easier to judge. Now choose another feather section and use exactly the same procedure as before to tie it in at the point where the thread is. By the way, while tying in the section, take great care not to wind the thread around the legs by mistake, since this would upset the whole dressing. Cut away the surplus material and use the dubbing to fill in the remaining section of the shank. The third pair of legs must be tied almost directly behind the eye, making sure they are longer than the previous pairs. While tying the legs in, take care to leave a small space immediately behind the eye. As before, tie in the one facing you first, and then the other. Snip away the excess, and bend the second feather section forward in the same way as you did with the first one. Pinch it onto the rest of the dressing with the fingers of your free hand, and tie it in with several winds of thread.
Slip away the material that's left over, tie off your dressing, and the nymph is ready for use. This is chenille. For years, American anglers have used chenille, cock feathers, and nothing else to tie nymphs and streamers like the Montana stone, the nymph we are going to tie now. On a pre-prepared weighted hook, tie in a tuft of fibers from a black cock feather to simulate the tail. Now tie in one end of a piece of chenille of the same color. The next step is to make the abdomen. As its name implies, this fly comes from Montana, where it is widely used on the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers, and it was created to simulate the nymph of a stonefly better known as the black willow. After covering about two-thirds of the shank, tie in the chenille. and snip off the excess material. Choose another smaller piece of the same material to make the wing case. Double it up, position it on the shank level with the thread, and tie it in. If necessary, winding the thread onto the abdomen to make sure there are no empty spaces. Now choose a black cock hackle. Strip the quill clean at the base. And tie it in diagonally, immediately in front of the wing case, with the tip facing backwards. The thorax is made of bright yellow chenille. Tie one end of it in where the thread is. And then wind it on towards the eye. Tie it in, and snip away the part that's left over. At this point, use hackle pliers to wind on the cock hackle making sure that it is inserted between the spirals of chenille. Tie in the hackle right behind the eye and cut off the excess. Now bend forward the black chenille, making sure that the two ends are close together and that they flatten all the fibers on the top side of the fly. Tie in the chenille with a good number of winds to strengthen the whole dressing. And after cutting away all excess material, keep winding on the thread so that it completely covers the chenille.
The Montana stone can be tied in various sizes and colors and can be used for the majority of dark-colored stonefly nymphs. In fact, the shape and color scheme are particularly alluring for trout. This example is called Ted Stonefly, a brown version created by that great expert of nymphs, Ted Trueblood. A large stonefly imitation is cast across the current. The trout strikes at it. The angler sees the fish move and his reaction is immediate. However much it struggles, the trout is securely hooked. The short, sharp fight ends in inevitable surrender. In the United States, this technique is known as the Leeson Ring Lift and is named after its inventor. The trick is to cast a weighted nymph upstream of a swimming trout and then hold it there, lifting it when it gets close to the fish. Usually, the reaction is instantaneous. Actually, this technique is a variation of Sawyer's induced take in that it exploits the instinctive reaction of the trout. In this case, the fish strikes at a prey that seems at the last second to be escaping. This kind of fishing is always based on the same thing, visual contact. But in England, the cradle of fly fishing, the same technique is traditionally used without visual contact and with a series of wet flies on the same leader. These are caddis pupas that have just emerged from the case in which they have been for some time. This order of insects deserves particularly close attention, and I will be going into them in detail in my next tape. One of the first steps in tying a caddis pupa is to tie the body by winding bright green poly onto a Tiemco 207BL hook, which has been designed specifically for reproducing caddis flies in this stage of their existence. Wind on the poly after weighing down the hook with a spiral of lead and tying in a piece of copper wire which will be used later for the ribbing. The poly must cover well over two-thirds of the shank and must be very compact both on the thread and on the hook. After finishing off the body of the caddis, use hackle pliers to make the ribbing with the copper wire. As usual, the ribbing must be made with wide spirals wound on in the opposite direction to the main dressing. Tie the wire in with several tight winds of thread and cut away the part that's left over. In this stage, the wings are not yet spread. Use the tips of two red cock feathers to simulate them, first stripping the quills of all unneeded fibers. Starting on the side facing you, position the feathers one at a time on each side of the body at the point reached by the thread. Tie them in, making sure that they are angled slightly downwards and fit snugly against the body. In any case, keep in mind that other materials will be tied in at this same point, so the position can be improved at a later stage.
Select a partridge feather and remove a few fibers from the area above the downy section on the quill. And use them to simulate the insect's legs, which are still tucked into the underside of the body. To achieve this effect, tie in the fibers on the underside between the two wings. The time period before hatching can last several hours, and during this time, the caddis pupa is very active, first swimming in quick darts, and then, depending on the species, either hatching out of the water on a twig or stone, or floating on the surface. To simulate the pupa's long, still unextended antennae, use two fibers taken from a pheasant's feather. Position them on the top side of the fly, close to the eye, and tie them in so that they face backwards, slightly separated. To complete the caddis dressing, use squirrel or rabbit fur dyed olive green. Apply the fur to the thread fairly compactly and wind it on, forcing the antennae back. Establish their final angle with one wind of dubbing behind them and one in front. Then use the whip finisher to tie off the fly with a double knot. This kind of imitation is amazingly effective in all waters, often proving so alluring that it will attract the attention of trout which are feeding on a completely different species of insect. A careful look at a handful of fresh water weed will reveal a myriad of tiny creatures. Among them is likely to be the gamorous, a freshwater shrimp of the amphipod family. The gamorous is found in different sizes, depending on the location and the species, and normally measures from six or seven millimeters to two centimeters long, its color varying from grayish to greenish, from orange to dirty yellow. Green gamorous are found in rivers in many parts of Europe, and especially in central Italy. The example we are going to tie adapts well to the requirements of anglers in this region. On a grub hook, which does not necessarily have to be weighted, tie in a small tuft of fibers taken from a cock feather dyed olive green. Snip away the excess material and shorten the fibers into a small tail. Now give the fly a glimmer of iridescence by tying in a piece of copper wire at the point where the thread is. This is latex. It is sold in a wide range of colors. In this case, choose a greenish piece. Cut a small strip. The width depends on the size of the hook. Tie it in close to the tail. Make sure that it fits around the shank and that it is securely tied in because at a later stage, the latex will be stretched forward to take advantage of its natural elasticity. Snip away the excess material. Now select an olive green cock feather. Strip away all the fibers at the base of the quill.
and tie it in sideways on with the tip facing backwards at the point where the thread is. Secure the feather with numerous winds of thread. And cut away the excess part of the quill. For the next step, use a bright green poly dubbing. Before the ban on seal hunting, the material used at this stage was seal's fur. The poly should be lightly compressed on the thread and then wound on to give the imitation a slightly humped look. Now use the hackle pliers to wind on the feather in large spirals up to the eye. Tie it in with a few winds of thread and cut away the excess material. Use your fingers to spread out the cock fibers on the top side. And bend forward the strip of latex, stretching it so that it covers the whole dressing. Obviously, the latex must be securely tied in at the eye, so make sure the thread covers a good portion of it. Now, snip away the excess latex and proceed to the next stage, the ribbing. The copper wire should fit between the cock feather spirals, almost biting into the back of the shrimp with tight, equidistant winds. Tie it in next to the eye with several winds of thread. Cut away the excess part of the wire and tie off with a couple of tight knots. Cut the tying thread and then Use the scissors to trim the cock fibers, which, when the dressing is finished, should not extend beyond the length of the hook. Finally, give the top side of the gamorous a liberal coating of glue. This will not only strengthen the whole dressing, but also make the colors brighter. The gamorous lives among stones and weed on the bottom of fairly shallow waters. It swims sideways at great speed, but always in the shadow of stones and weed. In many rivers where the water is cold and well oxygenated, these amphipods are found in great numbers and play an important role in the diet of the fish. Here's a trout lying in wait along the edge of a bank of vegetation ready to gobble up on lucky shrimps.
This time, however, it falls for the trap set for it by an angler using as bait the imitation just described. But this trout too, like all the others we catch, will soon find itself free again to continue its daily struggle for survival. These are the materials we will be using for our next imitation, a dragonfly nymph. Start with a streamer hook. Select a tuft of light green fibers from a marabou feather. When these soft, supple fibers are in the water, they tend to undulate like a swimming jellyfish, and this makes them extremely alluring. Next to the tail, tie in a piece of medium-sized dark green liquid lace. This particular imitation is virtually a link between nymphs and streamers. Consequently, the fly has features which take a few liberties from the imitation point of view, but which make it almost irresistible for fish. Twist generous quantities of green poly onto the thread to make the body. While winding on, continue to keep the dubbing as compact as possible so that it forms a long, tight cone. Repeat the procedure several times until the body is complete. Then, after cutting away part of the marabou fibers, create the ribbing by winding on the liquid lace, keeping it well stretched in wide spirals for the length of the abdomen. Tie the liquid lace in with a few tight winds of thread. Now, bend the marabou fibers forward to cover the nymph's body and tie them in with the usual tight winds. Snip away the excess material and generally clean up the dressing. Now cut two little tufts of marabou in a darker green and use them to make the legs. Tie them in one at a time on the sides of the body. Start on the side closest to you, making sure that the tips of the fibers face backwards and are angled slightly downwards. In this case too, the marabou does more than just simulate the legs, actually giving the nymph a semblance of life, especially when being worked. By alternating slower movements with sudden spurts of speed, the angler can work the nymph so that it creates a very effective imitation of a real dragonfly nymph swimming through the water looking for food. After tying in both tufts, cut away the excess material. The first step in tying the thorax is to cut out a small rectangle of dark green latex. Tie the latex in with a few tight winds, making sure that it fits perfectly onto the shank.
Now use another generous amount of poly to create the thorax, which, when finished, should look like a tiny bead. Bend the latex forward. Tie it in. and snip off the part that's left over. The marabou tuft used for the next stage has, to tell the truth, little in common with the crest of the real insect. It does, however, serve to create an undulating effect in the opposite direction to the legs. Since the fibers are not so long, they are a little stiffer, which, during working, creates a different movement to the other appendages. Tie in the tuft as straight as possible right in front of the thorax. In this case, however, it is preferable to use the tips of the marabou fibers. Now tie in two softer tufts to add another pair of legs. The procedure is the same as that used for the first pair. Dragonflies belong to the Odonata order and are subdivided into two lower orders, the Zygoptera and the Anisoptera. They are usually found in stagnant lakes and pond waters. Depending on the species, the nymphs live from one to three years. They are carnivorous and expert hunters, their prey often as large as fry and tadpoles. Dragonfly nymphs are also excellent swimmers. As they move off the bottom towards clumps of weed and canes in search of food, they tend to alternate slow movements with sudden spurts of speed. After tying in the second tuft, snip away the excess material and cut the fibers down to size. They should be about the same length as the preceding ones. To tie the head, use a second piece of latex, but this time it should be trapezoid in shape. Tie it in tightly on the longest side, making sure that it fits perfectly over the material underneath, and that when it is bent forward, it will easily cover the materials that must still be added. These black plastic beads on either end of a short peg are an ideal solution for simulating the eyes of large nymphs. Position them on the hook so that they are perfectly centered and tie them in firmly crisscrossing the thread over the peg. The head of the dragonfly nymph is quite big. Make it with poly of the same color used before. Wind it on so that it covers all the free space between the eyes and the thorax. Now wind on some more dubbing to complete the head. Finally, fold the latex forward, keeping it slightly stretched, and tie it in close to the eye with numerous winds of thread, which must cover as much of the material as possible, with the thread actually biting into it so that it is tied in securely.
After cutting away the last excess material, tie off the fly using the whip finisher to make a couple of tight knots. First one, then the other. When used in natural or artificial reservoirs, this particular nymph has proven to be excellent for trout and an almost infallible lure for black bass when cast with floating line and long leader. that we have come to the end of this chapter, the least I can do is bow out where I began, in the river. None of us can profess to be unmoved by scenes like this. Is that only because we're anglers? I don't think so. These crystal clear waters have seen centuries of history, of fishing, and above all, of man's deeds and misdeeds. Yes, man has only himself to blame for the progressive deterioration of an unrenewable heritage, our natural environment, the world that belongs to us, and which it is our responsibility to pass on intact to future generations. Perhaps this is why the true angler has learned not to kill his catch. If anyone lacks this conviction, he should try to see it as a necessity. We cannot allow all this to disappear. This trout's brief struggle epitomizes the fight that nature is waging to survive man's negligence. This is just another reason why the fish must be released. Actually, fly fishing symbolizes one of mankind's great behavioral mysteries. The need not so much to do something, but to know how to do it. Within a fly fisherman, there is the soul of a hunter who lived millions of years ago, when it was not a question of how to hunt, but what to hunt. And yet today, the angler responds to the discipline of his need to satisfy his search for himself and his own measure of excitement. We may have caught a thousand trout, but the most important one is the next one, the one that is still unknown, the one that will pose a new problem requiring a new solution. Whether you're fishing for young brown trout or royal chalk stream trout, it makes no difference. Today, more than ever, the only thing that matters is making the fish take the lure, reeling in the catch and releasing it. And of course it is equally important that when you take your eyes off the water and look around, you see that the presence of man is in total harmony with the environment and that there is always another trout, and another, and another after that, forever. In this second chapter, I focused on another significant but relatively small aspect of the remarkable world of fly fishing. There is much, much more to discover, and with this in mind, I look forward to continuing our adventure together.